came is because there was a while there where there was like people were doing infinite, yeah, uh, and those were really obnoxious. Like that was really obnoxious to read. Right. Well, the internet is kind of designed around you. It's, it kind of emulates print itself. Like it's just a purely most well, except for I guess for sound. Uh, but websites with sound on them are obnoxious as well. <laughs> Uh, but on uh, Butter and also people added um, Easter eggs, so there's like things in the background of comics you can click on to find things that maybe you know, years ago. Uh, um, and we've also added soundtracks to a few of the comics that uh, we try to make them work without the soundtracks, but we did, uh, we got an extra embellishment taking advantage of the medium, but we really don't. Do that. The internet is very predisposed to things that you can look at and understand in under 15 seconds or so. So, um, basically anything outside of that is just a huge hurdle for the average person on the internet to, like, do you, do you see any perception in statistics for your comics that have a few words versus those that have many, many words? Uh, right, because some, of, some of my some comics of have lots of words. Many of yours are over 15 seconds. Yeah, uh, I should work on that. Um, I was actually going to say it's interesting because you do have websites and online you can do incredibly inventive stuff that you can't do on print. And the less you have comics that don't do that. I mean, I personally like it because when I write a comic in the morning, I'm never facing a blank sheet of paper. I know the T-Rex is probably going to be in it. There's going to be some conversation at some point. So it's sort of restrictions you can work with. But I found, I was worried when I started out that it would be really restrictive. I've got six panels, three characters, so much you can do. But you can really play with it with the form, and you can say three weeks later, the third panel will change the visual narrative. And so I think restrictions, in a very real sense, do help creative process. You have to, something to bounce off against. You have a wall you can bounce off against. Uh, just an infinite canvas where you go to work. There are a lot of same panel uh, same, uh, You know which comics? I found this terrible because there's there was one uh, David Lynch did one in the 70s called The Angriest Dog in the World. It was really good. It's just this angry dog for three pounds, and he's so angry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've uh, seen a couple of people who've done some of some you'll say, "Hey, you really inspired me, and this is a comic I've been doing." But they usually stop after like three weeks. So I guess it wasn't that inspiring. <laughs> That's uh, kind of a, inspiring. But there was a Canadian comic called Pedigree Girls by Sherman Teacher that ran in, uh, that was a print comic, but also employed the same artwork week after week. Yeah. <laughs> Insomniac Press, they probably have a booth here. <laughs> Ryan, what's the name for that meeting? What, what do you call it? The same repeating the angry stuff? No, 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 no. The, the name of the, of the medium went the same image every I do a repeating. Uh, there is a uh, there is a group of uh, comics theorist uh, enthusiasts, the uh, buffo uh, of European comics, within that idea of restrictions, where you will use the same image, or you will do a comic in which uh, there are no words, or in which there are no pictures, or always putting some sort of restriction on it. Uh, and there's a book called uh, 99 Ways to Tell a Story, where the same story is told with different artwork and different style. Each of the 99 so that, that, and they borrowed it from a French literary that was uh, really both doing literary the experiments at the same time with very strong restrictions um, and, and, you know, flexing their muscles within those. I think there's a question. Question, please. Right, right, right. We haven't mentioned uh, your other webcomic, uh, Transmission X, and actually there are the several collective. Toronto cartoonists yeah. who... Uh, could, could you tell us a bit about the whole project? Uh, yeah, well, Transmission X was a collective of, I think, nine of us. Andy here, Andy here is part of it. Uh, Cameron Stewart does um, a lot of work for DC Comics. Mike Cho, uh, local artist. And anyways, it was uh, basically um, all of us had these stories, these ideas we wanted to put out there, and we found with uh, the print uh, company, um, they're not willing to take as many. They can be free now. Um, but uh, they, a lot of companies are afraid to take uh, chances on, on, on sort of, uh, unproven writers and artists. So rather than try to sell our ideas to a publisher, we just figured let's create a platform for ourselves of uh, quality comics, you know, good writing, good art, entertainment for all ages, and uh, put it out there. And you know, they blossomed quite quickly. And, uh, 
realm doing quite well with it. Not, it's not a financially stable thing, but many of the guys have got the options now. I know Cameron was approached by Vertigo for his. Uh, a couple of the guys were approached by Devil's Due or a couple of French publishers or Charles Christopher. So it's just a great way of getting our ideas out there, letting people enjoy them, and hopefully someone comes across and you know, says, hey, I want to print this for. There are a few of us as well who are going to be self publishing the books for next year and taking that into our own hands. Uh, you touched a bit on something that uh, I thought we would ask is about the, the sense of uh, community amongst web comics, yeah. both uh, in this case a local Toronto community, yeah. yeah, but also a virtual community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I think, I think web comics overall is, is uh, a community, like, it's all based on links and promoting each other. Like, it's not, if people ask me, like, how do you advertise? I'm like, I've never advertised anything. I just promote, like, either link people, or they link me, or I mention them on the blog, and, you know, and send traffic their way, or real people send traffic my way. Just wait for Ryan to link to us. Yeah, wait for Ryan to, to link to us, and, you know, we're all <laughs> golden at that point. So. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's very much a community. I know that, that mine grew because of a series of links, for sure. Without the internet, nobody would know who I was at all, and, uh, and it's a very forgiving sort of medium where, where, where it can be very unpolished, but if people like it, then you have an audience anyway, and I don't know if you can find out so much with friends, but they'll let you get better on your own time, in a way, um, and, uh, and encourage you, which is nice, but, but definitely the, the community with the linking and everything, that, that helps as well, you can always find. But isn't that kind of terrible that uh, it's through things? Like, what if there's this guy who's got a great comic, but we don't like him personally. And then no one links to him. That's, that's, that's why I never link to you, actually. You know, but, oh, no, I, I've never come across that myself. But, you know. but there's just plenty of people out there who don't know him personally that might then appreciate the work and do that sure. linking. Right, I'll go plus the bad. Yeah, there's a question. Please. Is it you? <laughs> No, to answer your question, no, Ryan can't link to you. <laughs> Is it any good? <laughs> That's a big part of it. And I think a lot of people will like email me uh, their comic links. And Check out my comic, can you promote it on your website or can you link to me? And I'll look at it if I like it, I'll promote it. If I don't, then I won't. Or sometimes I'll get something like, you know, I do like a Call Angels adventure comic and then some guy sends me his comic about 30 something cents. And I'm just like, I, I can't link to you, I'm sorry. It's great, beautifully rendered, but I have ch I have children coming to my site and I can't send them to you know, fuzzy animals that make sense. Well, no, there's links. There's uh, we've done, we did a bunch of when we first started Translation X, we did a bunch of interviews online with different uh, comic forums, whether they be print forums or online forums. Um, I also we print postcards and business cards. I I, I like leave cards everywhere I go. So like uh, bars and stuff, I distribute them around the bar, leave them on the subway. I yeah, think that everywhere, you know, and they actually work though. People come and find the site. I think that most of your links are going to come from finding uh, someone who has a much bigger site that really likes what you do. Then, like uh, a lot of a lot of how things become popular is through the goodwill of other people who are popular, and that's how they got there. You know, it's, it's very organic. Yeah, um, there, there is a certain extent to which that was paralleled in the early days of uh, alternative comics as well, yeah. because in the back. Dunner columns, people would mention what they were reading. Uh, the Beguiling benefited because many cartoons would mention where they were shopping, uh, you know, and that's uh, that sort of a very natural. So I found a phone that Sarah was mentioned in the back of Right, that's And I'm not a big fan of just giving it time. I mean, my comic, I was doing it for two years before it really moved beyond me and my mom were reading it. And so 
I think once you've got like a two year archive, or even a one year archive, it shows it, it shows what you can do and some like some of it gets blocked, but you can say, hey, check this out. And by the way,